Thank you so much for coming on a beautiful day to listen to what I think is going to be a great talk. Uh, Robert Freudenberg works for a small outfit, sort of, a regional plan association, or associates, association. Um, and he is the head of their energy and environment unit, correct? Uh, and what these guys do, as far as I've been able to tell, speaking with Robert and uh, his colleague Tom Wright, uh, they think about how New York City works. Uh, they're sort of the, 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 full, the, the physician to New York, and they look about how the blood flow works, how, how all the various systems inside the body of, of New York City works, uh, thinking about what could happen, what should happen, and, uh, and we thought it would be great when we were talking about very theoretical and very macro global issues about risk, to just look what, how this process works out on a local level, and also to hear how people who actually have to come up with recommendations and analyze think about this. So with that, thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks for having me. Thank you uh, all for coming out for this. Um, it's, uh, it's a great honor to talk to you all. And I, as much as I'm going to be sharing with you information about how we look at things, I'm very eager for the conversation afterwards to hear from you about how uh, you might help us think about these things. Um, so, uh, as Miguel, Miguel mentioned, my name is Rob Freudenberg. I work for a Regional Plan Association, and um, today uh, in this presentation, I'm going to cover a, a few things um, with you all. Uh, first, I'll give a brief introduction, tell you a little bit more about who we are as an organization, tell you what we do and why we do it. Um, then I'll spend a little time characterizing the region through a few different lenses, uh, essentially how our region lives, uh, how we work, the jobs that we have. Uh, how our region moves, and then uh, this idea of how do we survive and, and thrive through interconnectedness? What are the systems that keep us together? Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the, the risks that, that we see that we're facing um, as we're doing long-term plans for the region. And I'll touch upon uh, just a little bit about how we're, we're starting to think about and, and plan for the region that I hope will lead into a conversation of, of how you can help us think about um, what, what we might want to think about as we think long-term. So um, in, in terms of uh, you know, who we are, um, our, our mission uh, is essentially to improve the New York metropolitan region's uh, metropol uh, region economic health, environmental sustainability, and quality of life uh, through research, planning, and advocacy. And I see the fonts didn't translate, so uh, the advocacy is a cliffhanger. Uh, but that's the, the third thing that we do. Uh, you know, we're called RPA. Essentially, um, what, what we say that RPA could stand for is uh, research planning and advocacy because the work that we do, we employ uh, about 30 uh, staff members with policy, planning, and uh, even architecture and design degrees. Uh, so we do a lot of heavy research into the issues that are out there. Um, we also are able to put together plans, um, both long term uh, for the big region and, and even at a smaller level, uh, municipally or, or sub-regionally. And then the ideas that we put together, the ideas that we put out there, uh, we advocate for them. So we think through the big issues, as, as Miguel mentioned, uh, I uh, like the idea of uh, thinking of us as a doctor uh, for the region. You know, we, we try and figure out what's coming down the line and what can we think about and how can we plan for that in the future. And then how can we advocate for the, the ideas that we're learning about that are, are good for the region uh, to make sure that we, we continue to be a good region. In terms of uh, the region that we work within, it's, uh, it's essentially the New York City metropolitan region. So if you think about all the uh, commuting counties to New York City, where, where are you likely to live if you, if you uh, work in New York City? That's essentially uh, our shed. It's 31 counties. Uh, it's made up of 783 towns and cities, uh, the majority of which are here in New Jersey. Um, and 23 million residents. Uh, so it's, it's a big region that we think about and that we plan for, um, but it, it all is interconnected as we'll talk about in a little bit. So how do we do what we do? Um, since 1922, our organization has been preparing long-range plans for the tri-state region. Um, if you go back to, to 1922, the, the city was very much the, the center of life. Uh, there was a little bit of activity outside the city, you know, growing in terms of communities. But you know, things started changing. More people started moving out of the cities. Uh, there was a little movement that way. Um, so our organization was formed around this idea that we don't want to just move about in a haphazard way. We want to plan in a, a very strategic kind of way, um, comprehensively. 
So we develop plans, and we've developed three plans so far. Each one uh, recommends policies and investments for a sustainable and prosperous region. You know, we take a look at, at the way things are changing and the way things we want to, uh, to, to see things grow, and we make uh, policy recommendations to help the region get there. So our first regional plan was, was done back in 1929. Um, again, it was, it was the, the time where things were starting to change. People were just starting to leave uh, the urban core and, and go more out into, the, into what were becoming the, the, the suburbs, uh, little bits here and there. So the first regional plan did a number of things. One of the things it did was really focus on the transit, uh, transportation and transit systems to make sure that the suburbs, uh, emerging suburbs, were connected to the core. So one of the, uh, you know, the, it's hard to see here, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the map there is kind of the trans transit and transportation system that was laid out in the first plan, a lot of which was picked up uh, by Robert Moses and, and implemented uh, in, in his own uh, unique way in, in the years that, that followed. Um, you know, we don't know when we're going to do our next regional plan. Um, it essentially comes down to how conditions change, how many things have changed uh, in the first plan, uh, or in the prior plan uh, before it that, that we need to do an update. So, you know, a good 40, nearly 40 years passed uh, between the first plan and the second plan, but a lot actually changed in that time. Um, you know, you had had the, the, the post-war uh, suburban boom and the baby boom was, was well underway and, um, you know, things had really drastically changed. And I think those who were running the organization at the time recognized that the region was becoming less of this one core with the suburbs around it, but maybe uh, a core with the opportunity to develop sub-centers around it. And you had places like Newark that, that had already developed. And, and, but the, the second plan saw the opportunity to kind of take the lessons learned in the major core and apply them in sub-centers outside the region. Uh, so the second regional plan really took a look at how do we develop the places outside the core to, to behave more like the core and make sure that they're all interconnected. So then as you come through the 60s, uh, you know, a lot changed, uh, a few uh, recessions, depressions, um, you know, the really tough times following uh, the Vietnam War and, and just the changing in, in the way uh, that people lived. Uh, you know, the, the suburban boom uh, sprawl was, was almost at its peak at that point. Um, open space was being consumed at really high rates. So by the time you get to 1996, uh, New York City's in a, in a depression. People are leaving the city in droves. Uh, we, we labeled that one a region at risk. Um, it was time to uh, change the way we were doing things uh, because if you didn't, uh, we really would be a region at risk of, of staying one of the top metropolitan regions in, in the country, if not the, if not the world. Um, so that plan focused uh, on a number of things as, as they all do, but one of the, the key pieces was this idea of um, uh, preserving open space, uh, really making sure that we highlight the large tracts of lands um, uh, around the region so that we don't lose it all to sprawl. Um, coming out of that plan, some of the, the policies that, that were implemented included the protection of the Highlands region here in New Jersey, uh, which now uh, safeguards water for, for five million of New Jersey, North Jersey's residents. Uh, similarly, out on Long Island, the Pine Barrens were protected in, in that way as well, and the development of the Gateway uh, National Recreation Area and the Long Island Sound Stewardship a lot of great environmental work uh, came out of that third plan, as did plans to reinvigorate our transit system, which uh, today we see the benefits of uh, as we have a, a thriving transit system today. So uh, as, as I said, we don't know when we're going to do uh, plans, but we did realize it is time for a fourth regional plan uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, given the changes that have been happening uh, in terms of climate change, which just had a, a minor mention in the third plan, though it was, was in there, um, and, the, and the concept of um, equity, uh, the fact that our region has become inequitable in, in many ways, uh, really drove us to, to take on a, a new uh, plan. And I think coupled uh, with that is the fact that uh, uh, our governance system seemed to be broken from, from D.C. to the, the, the state house, uh, houses of our, of our capitals. Uh, you know, there is a need for improved governance. So representing the, the core of our fourth regional plan is a real focus on climate change, equity, and governance reforms. Um, so our fourth plan will take us into the, into the mid-2040 uh, you know, or so. Um, and it's a really exciting time to be working at the organization, 
uh, knowing that we're uh, working on the, the ideas <coughs> and, and the policies and the plans that hopefully will lay the groundwork for, for the next sustainable generation. So at the heart of this fourth regional plan is really, um, you know, we've divided it into eight different areas. Um, you know, we're focused on uh, the importance of energy, economic development, uh, financing and governance, transportation, climate change, uh, how our communities live, uh, parks and landscapes, and housing. These represent the kind of core areas that we're focusing on and we'll be developing policy recommendations for um, in our plan. Why do we do regional planning? You know, there, there's, uh, you know, planning can be thought of from a number of different levels. If you, you live in a town like Princeton, there's a town planner, um, and, and he does a lot of great work, uh, you know, kind of looking at how the town will change and what, what buildings will be coming in, how will that affect uh, traffic and, and that kind of thing. And that's, you know, really more site level planning, uh, municipal planning. The idea of regional planning takes, takes thinking uh, to, to a bigger level and recognizes that the, the boundaries don't end, say, between Princeton and, and you know, in the next town, that, that there's more and more uh, to be thinking about as we plan. So uh, it really gets us thinking beyond the immediate, uh, thinking into the long term. We are a, a united region and need to be thinking together about how things will change. Uh, regional planning also brings in the perspectives of multiple stakeholders. Um, you know, what happens in Princeton is, is good for Princeton, but what happens for our region, there's, there's a lot more people involved and a lot more um, ideas and, and visions that we need to be thinking about. Um, it, by dissolving the boundaries between uh, kind of our, our municipalities and our counties and, and even our states, we really start to think about things differently and, and plan differently. You know, you, you're building a new train line or a new uh, train extension, you know, you don't think about um, just one town at a time, you think about how that ties into the larger core. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to consider best practices. Um, you know, what is working well in other regions? How can we compare ourselves to a region, say, in the, the San Francisco Bay Area or, or even London? Um, you know, what are the, the big regions doing that are making them thrive and, and successful? Um, but at the same time, as, as we think regionally, I think, you know, what we found as an organization is that we can take these regional ideas and bring them locally. Um, I think it, the work we do in communities, we often always have to remind people that they are living in, in a community, but they, they are part of a larger region. So that the impact, whether it's a, you know, a watershed they live in or, or a transportation commuter shed, you know, the decisions they make from day to day and the actions that they take from day to day have local implications, but also have regional implications. So it's really, it's another way of thinking, it's another mindset, um, but we found that it's, uh, it, it's quite effective. So I'm going to take uh, a little time now to characterize our region. Uh, how, how do we, you know, you'll, you'll see kind of both how we look at the region and, and what we know about the region and what we see coming down the line for the region. Again, we're in this mindset of developing a fourth plan uh, that's going to lay the groundwork for the next 25, 30 years. So we need to get a sense of, of how we're doing right now and, and what the region looks like. So like I showed you before, we're three states, 31 counties, uh, over you know, nearly 800 towns and 23 million residents. So kind of looking at population alone, um, you know, we're 23 million today and, and we've gained, if, if you look past, back over the past 20 years, um, and that's probably a little hard to read, but we've gained 2.3 million residents in the last 20 years. And uh, essentially we were, what this graph is showing is that, um, you know, we're, uh, as regional, as a share of the U.S. population, we're kind of starting to stabilize. We were on a decline as a share of the population, maybe losing population to other places, but that's starting to stabilize now as, as our population increases and, and, and balances with the U.S. population. Um, the idea of where we live uh, <coughs> has changed. This kind of speaks to what I was speaking about before. If you divide our region up into urban centers, uh, inner suburbs, the immediate suburbs surrounding the urban center, outer suburbs, which are kind of the former farmlands that are, are, have been developed, and then still in the rural areas, the places where there still are low populations uh, and low densities. You know, our region has changed over time, and, and you can kind of just, if you follow the red, the urban trend where most of our population uh, still lives, that's kind of, uh, it, it went up and then went down as the, the suburban uh, boom happened and sprawl happened in the 90s. And then we started creeping up again in terms of urban living. As, as we maybe all hear, there's, there's a demand and a desire now to live in urban places, and we see that reflected uh, in this. 
Um, you know, I think the idea is, is sprawl isn't necessarily dead, but it, it might be slowing. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of policies have been put in place to protect farmland and open space, and, and then the, the desire to live in more urban spaces has kind of made this shift where we're, we're getting more urban again. But as we look ahead to the future, um, it's also important to consider, you know, what does this region look like? Um, you know, we are, uh, we've done, as we do our fourth plan, uh, we're looking, we're doing our own projections, uh, trying to figure out how many more residents will likely be here by, by 2040. Um, and what we, our best guess is based on models that are out there, that there's going to be an additional 4 million residents in our 31 county region. And that region and that, that um, makeup composite of that uh, population will look quite different than it does uh, today in 2015. Uh, you can see a, a decrease in, in the percentage of white population, an increase in, the, in, in, all, uh, in both Asian and Latino population, a kind of stable, almost <coughs> decline um, pop population of, of black uh, residents in the region. So, you know, I think all of these things play into decisions that we make in terms of housing or in terms of jobs and, and, and those kinds of things and where people want to live. So we need to constantly be looking ahead to plan, make the plans that we make today. Um, and, and speaking of that, uh, you know, in order to accommodate 4 million people, uh, if this region keeps growing, we're going to have to add more housing units at, at almost, uh, you know, at almost 50 percent of the rate that we are now. So between 1990 and 2009, uh, we essentially had 59,000 new units per year over that time period. To accommodate those 4 million new residents, we're going to have to really turn that up and, and get to uh, 91,000 uh, per year to get us there by 2040 to accommodate uh, 4 million new residents. Um, in terms of jobs, so how we work, uh, in the past 20 years, our region gained 1.5 million jobs. Uh, and you see kind of the, the blips of different recessions and, and different uh, things like that. Um, you know, if you kind of look at, um, you know, more recently, how, how much job growth has taken place uh, in, in the city versus the suburbs, you see there's a, a, a much weaker growth in the suburbs and older cities outside of New York City. Um, you know, northern New Jersey, which is the the red line um, is really, it, it's amongst the poorest, it is the poorest performing um, in terms of job growth in the region. Um, so there's, there's kind of this disconnect that we picked up on uh, and that we saw as, as we're looking at this, that, that the most, much of the job growth has been in our urban core, particularly in New York City. Um, and that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, if we're going to keep living in the suburbs as we are, and you know, uh, we need to have the jobs there. Um, we need to make sure that there's still jobs or provide you know, the, uh, abundant uh, transportation systems that get people to the job centers. So you know, this kind of thing drives our thinking as well. You know, where are people working? Where are the jobs being created? Where's that momentum? Um, as we look ahead, uh, if we add 4 million more people, there is the potential for 2 million additional jobs uh, by 2040. And just a word on our, our how we're doing these forecasts, um, you know, we're, there's the historic trend that if you just follow it exactly as it's been going, you know, it kind of pops up to 2.4 uh, million jobs. And similar population, you know, we, we kind of divide ourselves between these different models. Uh, there's also what's called the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council. They are the, um, the MPO for the region. They are federally set up uh, to decide where transportation dollars will be spent in the region. So they have a, a, a deep interest in kind of forecasting and knowing where jobs and people are going to be coming in. Um, and they do their own uh, models for population and job growth. And, and they estimated a, a significantly, you know, pretty much lower than the historic trend. Um, and so what we did is we looked at Moody's analytics and we liked what they had to, to include in theirs and, and kind of settled somewhere between the historic trend and, and what NIMTIC was, was announcing. Um, you know, I think some of the, the major bottlenecks that NIMTIC might have in theirs is that they kind of put a cap on what's possible in New York City. Um, maybe with, uh, you know, there's going to reach a, an end to what can be rezoned in New York City in their minds. So I think as we've seen in the past that cities uh, find clever ways to, to rezone the areas that, that are um, currently seem like you wouldn't rezone them. So we leave a little more room for more growth in the urban core than, than does NIMTIC. Um, it's interesting to think about, you know, this is a, a car, you know, we all, a lot of us probably have cars. So, 
you know, we're, we, we're known for uh, talking about public transportation a lot as an organization, but it's really important to know how our region moves uh, by cars, too. So if you look at the region uh, in terms of uh, car ownership, about 20% of our region does not own a car. Um, that's, that's a pretty uh, significantly higher number than the U.S. average, and this kind of speaks to the, the strength of our public transit system. Um, 25, about a quarter of us uh, own one car, 32% um, own two cars, and then 22% own three cars or more. Uh, it's a lot of cars uh, for the region, but you see that we're, we're kind of tracking below the U.S. average. Um, but what we found, again, digging into the region a little more, um, and you know, you can kind of get a sense here that uh, you know, across the bottom are the counties of our region, and, and the more urban ones are on the left, the more suburban ones are on the right um, as you're facing them. So you see that uh, it really depends on where you live, how many cars you have. Uh, you see that number goes up significantly in the more rural counties and that the uh, urban, you know, M Manhattan itself is, has, is very highly skewed uh, towards, towards zero vehicles. So, you know, it's not enough to just say as a region we have this many, when you really dig in and, and find the details, you, you get to get a story that emerges and, and think that you're going to have to plan a little differently for regions, um, you know, where people have more cars or if you want to get public transportation out, uh, you have to think about that. Um, uh, as, as that last one showed too, you know, New Yorkers drive the least uh, compared to the rest of, of our region. Um, in terms of uh, building roads, uh, you know, there, there's, we reached uh, what seems to be a peak. Um, you know, today there's about 1,900 miles total of, of road building, um, of, of lane miles, sorry, in the region. Um, but you see how much uh, the, the car culture uh, boomed from the 1920s. I just announced my colleague, uh, our, our transportation director, uh, just came in, Rich Barone. How are you doing? So uh, he can stop me from saying anything wrong about transportation since we're in, in this area. Um, so essentially what we're finding is, uh, you know, if you look at Manhattan-bound uh, consumers, you know, between 1999 and 2010, you know, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of commuting uh, growth coming from New Jersey, uh, which is really significant and important. Um, as you know, we just held a, a, a panel recently looking at the, the issues between the crossings uh, across the Hudson River. Um, you know, we're, we're, is a, there's a serious bottleneck there. If you take a New Jersey transit train, as, as I do uh, a few days a week, um, a lot of mornings there's standing room only on those trains. Um, and then path trains, sometimes you have to wait for one to go by uh, to, before you get on. Uh, so there's a real uh, bottleneck in, in terms of the, the crossings between these and, and serious, as we'll, we'll talk about a little later in, in the conversation maybe when, with, with Rich, um, is that you know, we're really going to have to focus on how we make sure that this bottleneck is, is alleviated. You want me to say something on that? Or? That's okay. I'll just, I'll do the presenting, so yeah, that's fine. So, I mean, what, what we're also finding is that, you know, uh, as you saw on the other slides, greater population density leads to more transit usage. Um, you know, it, it makes more sense that the more people there are, the, the, the more space uh, kind of for, for living in buildings, uh, that there's going to be uh, more transit usage. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at our, our transportation systems, um, you know, what we found is that our region really contributes, uh, you know, a lot of uh, ridership um, to our national system as well. So, you know, the national <coughs> system uh, is really driven by the, the transportation that happens, um, you know, this is Amtrak in this case, uh, along the Northeast Corridor and, and trans travel into Penn Station. Um, we also found that um, you know, uh, rail ridership growth uh, has, has been uh, phenomenal over the years. Um, you, know, you look at New Jersey Transit, again, outperforming out, uh, all, all the others in terms of annual ridership, uh, but you know, in increases uh, in all of our commuter rail ridership. Um, we also found that the, the subways, um, you know, this is, this is, again, you see this kind of steep rise of, of subway use. It reached a peak in 19, 1937, um, and we're slowly kind of, uh, you know, just seeing if we can get, get back up there. And Rich, I don't know if you had anything to add about, about that. That's in terms of building new subway miles. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, with everything, I mean, including what Rob said earlier about the, about the uh, commuter rail system, we have been building for a very long time in a substantial way. Uh, you know, on the commuter rail side, the two tunnels we have were built in 1910, and there's been no new rail capacity added since then. So that's over 100 years of just the capacity we have. And one of the reasons why it's a big problem is because New Jersey Transit, when they started in the early 80s, 
they had a series of projects to funnel more and more people into Penn Station to make town direct services that everybody could you know, wear up and more Sussex lines, the Bruton line, uh, and just been adding more and more service. So we, we were jamming a lot of people into a very uh, small pipe, all right? Uh, the subways, uh, we've actually saw a contraction because we tore down several of the elevated lines in Manhattan because, uh, and some of the boroughs as well, uh, particularly the Bronx, uh, because it was considered a blight. And it was, you know, there was a whole deal on the east side of Manhattan to build the Second Avenue subway, which never actually happened. There was a tremendous amount of upselling in order to actually create new, desirable, uh, you know, residential skyscrapers on the east side of Manhattan. So we created all this additional density. We never built the subway. Only now are we in the process of building the first relatively small, short segment that goes from 63rd Street to 96th Street, which hopefully will be open by uh, uh, 2016, 2017, most likely. Uh, but that's only one of four phases of this roughly 13-mile line that runs from 125th Street all the way down to Lower Manhattan by the South Street Seaport, uh, specifically Hanover Place. So, yeah, we've, we've been doing some work in the last decade. Uh, really, it's the things like the Second Avenue Subway first phase, we call the East Side Access Project, which is bringing along a railroad underneath the Grand Central, about 100 feet below Grand Central Terminal, and the extension of the number seven train to the, uh, um, to the far west side. But those are relatively small projects compared to the amount of pressure that we have on the system. So I can go to that later. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, and then the idea that uh, you know there's been a transit revival since since, since the 1990s, and, and Rich, maybe you just want to talk through uh, this chart, kind of the, the yeah. impact of MetroCard. And well, that's a big thing, right? I mean, you know, everybody, you know, one of the things that really impact the use of transportation have been things that people wouldn't necessarily think about. They would think, oh, it's about new capacity over the new line or something like that. But really, it's policy changes like this, the MetroCard. MetroCard enabled free transfers between the subway and bus system. This never existed before had to pay, depending on, you know, you were on the bus, you paid, you were on the subway, you paid. It also created a, a limited 30-day card. So you could you buy your card, and when you buy the card, you want to use it as much as possible, your money's worth, people just use the subway for discretionary trip making that they never used it before in the past. So what we've seen as far as growth, which is good to a certain extent, I mean, the peak is really saturated. I don't know if any of you guys use the subway regularly, but it's really crowded. But we're seeing tremendous growth in the evenings and on the weekends. Um, you know, some of that some of that growth is because people are shifting out of the peak, but a lot of it is people just using the subway to get around, to take extra trips, and there's really because they buy these 30-day cards. So that was a big change. Another big change we're seeing is technology, as well, making transit more attractive. So you know, your smartphones and actually knowing when the next train's coming, the next bus is coming, trip planning, all that stuff is another thing that's made transit even more attractive and, and actually added, you know, contributed to the ridership growth. I um, mean, you know, along with the fact that you can actually work and do stuff on these vehicles now. I mean, the fact that you can actually, you know, check your email, you know, catch up on work with your laptop on a train makes it much more attractive than driving in when you actually waste that time. So, so then moving to, you know, final transportation mode is our, our aircraft. Um, and Rich has done a lot of uh, great work looking at our airports and, and how we're at capacity in our airports as well. And uh, you know this this slide you can talk through kind of you know how how changing our, our planes has also uh, yeah, led to it was changes. Yeah, surprise because back in 2011 we completed a two-year study with the Port Authority of New Jersey on our air, future of the region's airports, and the report came out saying that uh, we you know we looked at all different things inter intercity high-speed rail trying to capture some of this growth or outlying airports something called next gen which is the future next version of air traffic control which is a more automated system. Um, it allows for additional efficiencies and capacities. But, you know, um, in the end, it was all about new runway capacity. Just for the capacity that we need, we're, we're estimating, and we're conservative compared to the FAA, we're estimating about 150 million annual passengers, you know, by 2030. We're now, uh, when we did this estimate, we're about 107. We're now at 117. In a matter of a few years, there's been a phenomenal turnout at the airports, and we're above <coughs> our projected estimates for the airports at this time. We felt the airports would be at 150 million annual passengers, and so growth has actually happened faster. And the reason why is because of the aircraft upgaging that's occurred. Um, you know, it, it's weird because you hear the stories about the A320, this massive Airbus plane that's actually not doing that well. They're not selling a lot of them because it's just too big. But we're going from a relatively small regional jet, smaller regional jets, to things like triple sevens, which, and you know, and you're seeing more of the fleets being triple sevens or wide body aircraft compared to narrow uh, body aircraft. So they have, and beyond the fact we're just getting 
overall bigger planes on average, you're seeing the planes with a higher um, load factor. So there's more people in every plane. Uh, as people that travel probably are aware of, there aren't many empty seats anymore. So you get on a plane, you thought you could get the seat next to you. It's less and less, that's less and less of an option today. Uh, we're seeing load factors in the 90s, which in the past they were 70s, early 80s. So you know, they're utilizing the aircraft to a greater extent than they used to as well. But still, we're getting to that limit where there's not much more updates you can do. If you get a big, or super large aircraft, like a 320, which is not selling, you have to have a huge market that you're going to to make that actually viable for the cost of the aircraft, if it's a four engine aircraft versus a two engine aircraft. So we're again approaching that ceiling where we need new capacity. And we're actually, we, we originally estimated we need new capacity over the 2020s. I think we're still in line that we need the new runways by then, at least one of the new runways by then, at JFK or Newark. So, it, and, it's a, and that's a big challenge because both airports expanding those airports in a very dense urban area. Uh, you know, JFK is not only a dense urban area, but it's actually a Gateway National Recreation Area, which is prohibited by uh, an act of Congress. We require an act of Congress to actually expand into the uh, Jamaica Bay. Uh, Newark Airport is even more hemmed in. So, you know, both will require, have substantial impacts. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about LaGuardia Airport. There's some, there's ideas to even close it, which is not a good idea. We actually responded to that this week because you have to basically build out JFK with two new runways that just absorb its impact, not to mention the growth that we anticipate. Um, but uh, you'd also, you know, there's other ideas to actually make it larger, which is interesting, but it requires demolishing Rikers Island, which I think relocating a prison is probably even more difficult than uh, you know, expanding an airport. So yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously there's there's a lot tied into that, and and you know as, Rich, as we can talk about later is you know having airports in a region is really important to the region, you know, being a thriving region. Um, that's why you see so many cities dealing with this, and places like Japan or you know building island airports to to make sure that they're accommodating the growth, you know that that brings jobs, that brings interest, that brings investment uh, by having world class airports. So uh, I just wanted to spend a little time just you know talking about the ways. I know that a lot of you are, are those of you who are uh, working in this um, this this effort are, are really just in the interconnectedness of things, and I think that's really important for us to consider all the different ways that our region is interconnected and connected to regions around it. Um, obviously, our intercity passenger network uh, is is a major. Uh, it connects us to each other and to the cities uh, across the country. Uh, RPA for for a while uh, ran what was called America 2050. Uh, that we still we still kind of work with. It's basically looking at the, this concept of a mega region. So you know, not just our 31 county region, but we're part of the Northeast mega region um, from you know Boston down to to Virginia. And there's mega regions across the country. Um, and intercity rail is is uh, critical in connecting these and creating these mega regions, and then connecting these regions to each other. Um, you know, as we'll talk a little bit about risk, you know, something goes down, a, a bridge goes down in, in Connecticut on the rail that shuts down. Well, you know, we had the, the crash the other day in Philly, which is still impacting all of our, our, our travel uh, to and from New York. You have a, uh, an, an impact in one city in, the, in a mega region, and it really impacts the, the rest of the cities down the line. Uh, the freight network, uh, you know, is significant. I know, you know, the symbol for your effort uh, is, is kind of that, that goods movement across uh, the world, which, which is very intriguing. Um, this is another uh, thing that we look at. Rich uh, works a lot on um, looking at port issues and, and freight movement and goods movement um, and, and can talk a little bit about that, but that's just something to put in your minds that, that we're focusing on as well as we're considering a, a fourth, as we're working on the fourth plan and considering a future uh, through 2040. You know, how do you, how do you accommodate the, the, the new, uh, you know, larger ships that need to get through to, to ports? Uh, obviously, regional transit connects us locally, um, and you know, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we had a, a summit uh, last week where we talked about the, the Hudson River crossing, and, the, and it continues to Long Island. You know, why why can't you get on a train in New Jersey and, and go to Long Island or or Connecticut? You know, regional transit is really important in in connecting us, and I think we're looking to find uh, efficiencies in that system as well. Um, how else are we interconnected? Well, uh, we all need power. Uh, we all need, um, you know, energy to, to, to live as, as we do. And it's really Im important to see how our region fits within the larger scheme of energy. Um, our region is situated in three regional, uh, what are called power pools. Um, and I think we saw during, during the blackout how kind of uh, an impact in Ohio uh, affected all of us uh, down here. 
Um, following on energy, you know, uh, looking at our power plant and power generation system uh, is really important, particularly as, as we look at uh, climate change and the impacts of climate change um, and, and, you know, what percentage of our, our power generation capacity is within uh, the floodplain that will be here in 2050. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. Um, and then where are we getting our fuel from? You know, what kind of fuel do we have? Um, you know, we've obviously seen a, a major uptick in natural gas uh, generation capacity in our region as natural gas became uh, abundant in the U.S. Um, you know, how is this going to change how, we're, how, how, we, how we fuel our, our energy future? Is, is natural gas the, the ticket or are we going to need to find um, other sources as well. Uh, do, does that take away the opportunities? Uh, does cheap and abundant natural gas limit our opportunities for other, um, you know, other fuels like nat uh, offshore wind or solar? Does it slow down us making the leap to that, um, to that fuel source? Um, obviously, open space is something that interconnects us all. Um, you know, we're, we are a region uh, of, of open space, and, and having that be connected and, and contributing to our, our, um, our well-being and, uh, and our you know, farm production, and you know, without open space, we, we wouldn't uh, be the region that we are. Uh, we have uh, nearly 9,000 square miles of undeveloped land in the region, including uh, you know, 2,600 square miles of that is, is considered protected and about 1,200, a uh, little, little more than 1,200 are, are agricultural lands. It's really important to consider how we're going to protect these uh, into the future. Um, and as we get to risk, the, the kind of thing that drives um, you know, some of the decisions that we make, it's, it's obviously we've, we've experienced a number of uh, threats and, and disasters uh, just in the past uh, decade or decade plus. Um, obviously, 9/11 was was a terrorist attack, uh, our blackout, um, and then a series of uh, kind of uh, weather or, in some cases, climate-related um, issues: uh, Hurricane Irene, the heat wave of 2011, the, the nor'easter of, of 2011, and then uh, most notably uh, Superstorm Sandy. Um, and you know what's what's next. So I think it's it's clear that we live in a time of extremes. Um, you know whether it is extreme weather, extreme heat. Uh, or the threat from, from terrorist attacks. So that, that really needs to drive how, how we plan. One of the things that I work um, most, mostly in is, is the concept of, of climate change, climate adaptation. Um, so you know, I think it, it's really important to look at our region in terms of, of how we develop. Uh, we are a region of water. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just filled with estuaries and streams and rivers and surrounded by ocean and bays so that the impacts of climate change uh, and, and the flooding that it brings is really upon us. Uh, we have one million people today who live uh, in current floodplains. Um, by 2050, that number will double to 2.2 million uh, that will be at high risk of flooding by, by 2050. And that's without any population increase, without anybody moving. You know, the, the floodplain itself is moving uh, to put more people at risk. What we saw in Sandy was that 26% uh, of our region lives in a census tract that experienced flooding during Sandy. That's just one storm. It could have hit differently and, and in different ways. 28% of our jobs are located in census tracts that flooded during Sandy. If you look ahead to 2050 and, and consider that floodplain again, 21% uh, of our public housing uh, will be in those floodplains. 59% uh, of our power generating capacity will be in the, uh, in the floodplains. And then four out of six of our airports uh, will be in, the, in the, that, those floodplains of, of 2050. So there's serious uh, considerations we have to, 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 con to take into effect when we're, we're doing planning uh, out to 2040. Um, other risks to the system is, is the risk of um, you know, funding uh, of projects. You know, so much of, of what drives our region is the infrastructure that, that keeps it uh, connected and, and moving. Uh, but projects are becoming both more expensive and taking longer to, to continue at the same time that we're getting less and less interest from Washington and, and other places to fund large infrastructure projects. That's a major risk that we have to consider if we want to keep this region uh, moving. Um, to that point, highways and bridges, uh, you know, there, there, there are high numbers of bridges and, and uh, you know, our infrastructure is crumbling and we really need to take that uh, into account. Um, then as we think of an energy future, you know, you, you also have to think of how these things intersect. Uh, you know, pipelines uh, are good for bringing energy in, but pipelines represent a risk to, to other interests in the region. Um, you know, we did a project a few years ago 
that looked at nat uh, n uh, landscapes across uh, the, the mega region um, that we're within. And, you know, we, we polled conservation uh, experts and found out what, what are threats to them. And nearly 20% at that point thought that, um, you know, energy projects were a risk to open space and open space protection. And I think we see that playing out right here in Princeton where there's opposition to a, a gas pipeline um, in, in our open spaces. Um, I think another threat, as, as I talked about at the beginning, is this idea of governance. Um, you know, we are one region with three states and 31 counties and, and all those municipalities, but look at all the other governmental jurisdictions that, that make up our region. Um, you know, we have all these tiny little uh, decision-making bodies and entities that make it really hard to make big decisions and, and particularly hard to make regional decisions. Uh, if everything is hyper-localized, uh, you're not going to get the best regional outcome, and you're not going to, uh, which I think translates to not not having a, a very good outcome for a healthy region. So as we're thinking ahead to uh, you know doing our fourth plan, uh, one of the things that that's really important to us is to consider how we grow, um, and if we continue to grow as as we are growing uh, today, we will, and those four million additional residents and two million additional jobs come here. Um, if we do it as we're doing today, we will consume 800 square miles of open space uh, that will be gone. Uh, we're going to leave those 2.2 million people at risk of flooding. Our older cities will continue to decline as we don't make the investments in them. Uh, equity issues and social issues will be, will be uh, exacerbated, will remain segregated. And the congestion that, that Rich is talking about, both uh, on the roads and in the trains themselves, uh, will continue to, to proliferate. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, we'll lose our edge as a region. Um, and so this is what's driving us as, as we develop our plan. So part of what we're doing is if, if we're going with those numbers of 4 million um, additional residents and 2 million addition, additional jobs, we've done some planning to kind of lay out how we will grow into the future. And, and these are just kind of some illustrations that show uh, how we could do that. This is how we're developed today, essentially the densities um, within our region. Obviously, you see it uh, focused uh, in, in the urban core in, in um, New York City, and then kind of the outlying areas. You can see some of the higher peaks for Newark and, and Jersey City and, and other places, uh, you know, the Rockaways. Um, but if, if we continue to grow as, as, uh, as we grow today in, in kind of the sprawl fashion, you can see how much, uh, you know, where those 800 square miles of land get gobbled up um and, and how our, our you know we look very different than we are than we do today with a lot of sprawl um if we make other better decisions and, and kind of limit sprawl but still um you know focus on on growing in maybe our local downtowns a little more in, in addition to the urban core you know we can consume a little less land and and, and develop in this way now, if we take the kind of extreme and, and kind of come up with policies and encourage policies that, that really push urban, high urban densities and, and urban development, um, you know, we can just really add on to those places that, that are um, out there uh, already densified with, without um, much consumption of open space. So these are the kinds of ways that we're, we're thinking about this. And then as you think about each of those scenarios, you know, how do you connect uh, uh, the things, uh, the, these communities, these new communities uh, through transportation? This is just an example of all the potential projects that, that could be um, you know, just getting us across the Hudson River. Um, you know, we also have to consider our, our energy again. If, if we're how we develop, uh, you know, is, is a more distributed system better than these uh, centralized large systems over half of which will be in a floodplain. So the idea of microgrids and distributed generation plays into the, the thinking of, of what we're doing. And then, uh, you know, the <laughs> idea of, of climate change and flooding and risk, um, you know, really is important. Uh, you know, there's, there's that layer of, you know, where we grow and whether they're urban areas or not. But then as you dig a little deeper and look at the floodplain, um, you know, how will we grow even in the urban areas? Uh, you know, is it, is it safe, is it smart to develop, say, in the Rockaways of Queens, which is, you know, if the blue there represents the floodplain of 2050, is that the place we want to make our investments and, and, and building, um, you know, putting these additional 4 million uh, residents? And, it, you know, it's not just the urban areas, and it's, you know, it's like Secaucus, New Jersey, Milford, Connecticut, um, you know, the suburban places as well will be facing these challenges, and you have to consider uh, different ways to make, be more resilient to that. Uh, just to kind of say that, that as we focus on resilience at RPA, we're, we're looking at um, what we're calling the five R's um, and, and recognizing that there's no one silver bullet approach to any of this. 
Uh, you will be rebuilding in certain areas. You just want to make sure you rebuild to a, a higher standard. Uh, we still will need to keep water out through the idea of resist, um, and that could be a, a, a local municipal seawall, or it could even include the idea of a storm surge barrier that closes off New York Harbor and, and maybe makes some of that more urban densified area uh, a little safer during storms. Um, and then, you know, the idea of retaining, you know, capturing this additional uh, rainfall that comes in increased and more frequent uh, precipitation. And then I think we're, we're also looking at the idea of restoring natural systems. What role can they play in, in helping mitigate uh, these climate impacts? And then we're, we're taking on another thorny issue, which is the issue of maybe we have to leave some of the areas that we've developed uh, already. Um, you know, those, those blue lines as, as we've drawn them uh, are, are pretty high, and, and it doesn't make sense necessarily to keep investing over and over again to rebuilding places that will continue to see flooding. Um, so we're taking on the, the issue of retreat uh, very seriously and considering ways to, to make sure that all of our, our residents are safe, but that also municipalities who, who don't want to lose residents um, in these places um, are, are able to kind of build up the tax base in other places in town. So that's just kind of a, a, an inkling of, of where we're heading, what we're thinking about. Um, you know, I think as, as we develop our fourth plan, we have ideas. We have ideas already on, on paper that we're throwing around in the office. Um, but I thought it would be a great opportunity to maybe share those with you in conversation, in, in Q&A if it, if it comes up. But uh, also just open up the opportunity to, to ask questions, but also share with us your thoughts um, on, on how we might approach this uh, kind of um, interesting task of, of planning long term for, for, for the region. Uh, but thank you for, for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions. Yes. I think it's an obvious kind of question. If you think about it historically, um, when you think back before the RPA, let's say the Pittsburgh plan, um, and to early 20th century planning, the question has always been uh, plans are great, um, and they make a lot of rational sense. Um, and in the real world, they almost never uh, are uh, implementable uh, for all kinds of uh, reasons. And so I'm just wondering at this point in history, uh, how, what's the RPA's vision of the best way to go about gaining some kind of acceptance uh, for implementation of these parts of a, of a plan? I mean, the great thing about a plan is it's comprehensive. Yeah, no, I think uh, I, I'll start and let Rich, Rich take over. Um, but, you know, because I think transportation is where we've seen many of our successes in terms of implementation. Um, I think part of it is, is that we're, we're working with the folks who will need to implement it now and kind of talking about the ideas. And, and you know, we don't put out, out ideas that are pie in the sky. We, we push the envelope. Uh, but we do it guided by the research that we do and the planning that um, the best practices that we've seen around the country. But I think what's really important is that we're already uh, working with um, you know, decision makers and those who would implement the ideas that we have uh, to make sure that that, that groundwork is started. Um, and, and once we start with an idea and put an idea out there, we, we don't stop. Um, you know, the, the Second Avenue subway is, is one example that, that was in our first plan. And Rich brought it up here today, talking about how part of it is being implemented and, and uh, the rest uh, will continue to push for being implemented. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's really, uh, the plans are never, if you look at all of our plans, nothing's ever been implemented, you know, completely, or even, even half, you know, in most cases, right? Um, our president would never say. Yes, well, that's just, that's just the honest, that's, that's just the truth. Um, but parts of it have been, some of it have been actually, you know, uh, reimagined, so parts of it kind of got some ideas going and there was much change. So for example, the third plan, as Rob mentioned, with the, you know, the Second Avenue Subway was part of another idea, another initiative that we put together that included the Second Avenue Subway and East Side Access. But, you know, in, in the end, that, you know, that combined initiative, which was more like the RER idea from, from Paris, didn't actually happen, but instead we got the Second Avenue Subway started, <coughs> and East Side Access started. I actually would disagree respectively with my colleague regarding our success in transportation. The third plan, we have the third plan, the one area that actually has done, got really done, has the best success, or the most successful, has been the open space part of the plan. Stuff like the Pine Barrens and the Highlands and what have you. There's been a lot of, in, you know, RPA's done basically the Brooklyn waterfront uh, work, Hudson Park. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff that RPA's been part of on open space that's actually been extremely successful over the last couple of decades. Um, and that was under, under 
Rock Ronnie, you know, <coughs> I mean, transportation, we're constantly engaged. It's one of the areas everybody knows us for, uh, but we do a lot in those areas as well. And it's really about working with the agencies. We work an interesting civic in the sense that some, you know, most civics, a lot of civics have like an outside, more outside public game where they try to convince the, folk, the folks from the outside to do things. We do, we do it both ways. We try to, we work with the agencies uh, and, the, and the politicians at the same time. We also work you know, outside as well with the public as much as we possibly can to push our ideas. But it all, it all starts with, I guess, you know, we try to solve research base to start with and then kind of, you know, and be collaborative, which is what we think is important too. In the current plan, we're taking it a little bit further than we've done even in the past as far as outreach, as far as working with a lot of grassroots organizations too. So we're trying to do more on the public side of things than we've done in the past. So I think, I would hope that this plan will have, you know, the greatest success, at least in the most, you know, I guess in the last several decades for RBA to actually get our ideas at least out there and show that we're actually are listening to folks throughout the region. Uh, on this public side, uh, the issue of flooding is um, obviously going to be influenced by who people think is responsible for that problem. Mm. And, and I, I notice uh, quite a lot of variation if you look around the world in terms of how people think about that from yeah. country to country, especially when you're thinking about how you're going to sell and retreat, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and where I come from, the UK, people still think it's absolutely the government's responsibility and are absolutely outraged if there's any kind of shortcoming in a response to a flood situation like mm -hmm. the last couple of years we had. Um, I, I don't know, is there any kind of survey data on kind of on this that you're kind of you're aware of, I'm actually quite intrigued to know what people would kind of have people would think about this. Yeah, no, it's I, we haven't asked. We we did a survey leading into this plan, but the the topic topic of retreat or or even recovery was not one of the topics on on the survey. But you know, just from project work we've been doing, um, kind of in resilience uh, around this idea, working with local municipalities. I mean, people, you're right, want the government and and put the onus on government to come in and get them back into their home. But people, draw, you know, once, once they're back in their home, that's their home and, and they want the government to stay out. So yeah, no, no people, uh, you know, none of, none of the residents that we've talked to or even the mayors that we've talked to are, are talking about this idea of retreat. They don't, they don't want to talk about it unless they've been a community that's participated in buyout programs. Um, so it's, it's a really tough nut to crack in a way because there, there's so much more to it than just, you know, a, a transaction. It, there's a lot of psychology and emotion and, you know, generational ties to home and, and wanting to live on the coast and, and those things that, that you can't get through, you know, through government communications or, or even planner communications. So we're actually, you know, we're considering uh, maybe we bring this topic to, to a group of behavioral science, uh, scientists to kind of think through what are, what are ways that we can be more effective on this topic because it's not going to go away. And, um, you know, we want to be able to talk about it in the right way so that it doesn't turn people off. Um, it, it, it's a really challenging situation. I think it's gotten more complex, right? I mean, it used to be, it was, in the UK, the barriers kind of like a lot of people left were just doing things like that. Uh, now it's sort of more of a, like a, a distributed kind of approach to dealing with these problems. Even the folks that are famous for us, the Dutch, basically, advocate for that as far as the like natural environment and, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, where you actually build, where your population is versus just building, uh, you know, a barrier. And one of the big reasons that you always remind me about is it's not just about the surge, it's about sea level rise. So there's, there's a, and that's the thing that is not really a protection. Okay, so. And the, I mean, the other thing, too, to that point is, um, you know, you saw all the numbers of governance agencies that we have, you know, a number of municipalities. You know, that's, that's a decision that will need to be made at the municipal level. Um, ideally, it would be a, a conversation that's happening regionally, but, you know, even with the buyout programs, a single homeowner, more often than not, cannot buy, you know, be bought out unless their neighbors are also involved because these programs tend to favor groups of homeowners selling, selling their homes out. So it, it requires leadership at the local level, and then the local level is 788 layers uh, you know, deep. So it's, it's really challenging. Yes? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering, a bit of a follow-up on the sensor's question. Um, I wanted to, to push a little bit and ask you, what is your strategy actually dealing with all these multiple partners that you mentioned, the, all the co levels of mm -hmm. government? Um, like, do you have a, a PR uh, office? Uh, how, how do you put your ideas? Do you also connect 
uh, horizontally with partners who are like-minded uh, in order to push ideas? I mean, how, how difficult or how, you know, what's yeah. the, what is the technology? That's a really good question. And I think, you know, one thing that's on our side is the fact that we've been around since the 1920s. So the relationships that started building in the 20s in a lot of ways remain today with the agencies and, and the different levels of government, the implementers, even though they're different people, obviously, those, those relationships stay. Um, we do have uh, you know, a public affairs uh, office, you know, part of our office, uh, you know, a couple people and, and a, a designer, and we work with others. You know, we had a, a website that we put out last year called Fragile Success. And that was kind of like our communication piece that, that put out what is the state of the region uh, right now. Some of, the, some of the facts I got are, are from that. And I encourage you to go to that website, just Google Fragile Success and RPA. Um, because we recognize that communication of these issues, you know, it doesn't always hit people. Um, so we kind of tried to do that in a compelling way with interactive maps that let people kind of uh, figure out you know how far they are from certain jobs w if they have a certain education level you know really trying to get interactive and use the tools that are out there so I think building on our past relationships that have maintained adding the idea of kind of interactive and new tools and as Rich mentioned kind of uh, doing this real concerted effort to go out into communities um, and and work with people uh, on the ground uh, I think gets us there too but um, you know ultimately this comes down to to relationships and the relationships that we've built and will continue to need to build and continue to build over time yeah I would, I would, I would add just a, a little more detail for you we've actually through the Ford Foundation have funding to work to fund you know, grassroots organization membership driven organizations around the region different basically in Jersey and Long Island Connecticut, Valley, uh, and these groups are kind of, you know, going down and you know, presenting material that we're putting together for them. We're going to those meetings as well. We also have an outreach coordinator whose job is to kind of manage that process, as well as uh, work with us, work with local elected. So I'm um, like we had I have meetings with city council members and folks in the assembly and other, you know, both states. We have legislative folks. So we're doing that as well. So it's not just the politicians at the governor's office or the mayor. York, which we obviously meet with those folks as well, but it's the, the, the guys who represent the community boards or the, you know, the town councils and stuff like that. We're doing more of that than we've done in the past as well. So. Yeah, our biggest limitation is uh, how much time we all have uh, yes. to kind of be doing all these things, but uh, you know, we recognize the importance of, of getting out there as much as possible. Yes? Um, and Echo, thank you for a fantastic presentation. It's really interesting. Uh, a couple of questions that came up for me um, in, in listening to it. Uh, the first one, um, several of the challenges you mentioned have, um, if we look at things like the environment and look at things like crumbling infrastructure, I would add an aging public sector workforce with underfunded pensions. Each of these has been very difficult for state and local governments to deal with on their own, mm -hmm. let alone the fact that they're all going to hit at roughly the same time. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about your sort of ideas about fiscal solutions for that. Yeah. Um, and then, and well, one more question. Oh, yeah, sure. the, the second one is, as you think about these, the urban cores getting more and more dense, which I agree makes complete sense, um, that seems to run up against the fact that New York City housing in particular has become extraordinarily expensive. And so it's likely to become even more expensive the more dense it becomes. And so I'd love to know your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, um, you know, I think in, in terms of your first question, uh, in terms of uh, basically competition for funds at a time where funding is drying up, it, it really is a challenge. Um, you know, Rich has been, to, uh, it keeps funny, we keep answering for each other. You're answering the open space questions, I'm answering transportation. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the idea of public-private partnerships, I think, are, are, are going to be part of the solution that's, that's happened uh, around transportation. And I was just in a meeting yesterday with a number of uh, environmental organizations trying to think about what are the next ways to be able to fund open space protection at a time where that, that typically, you know, speaking of polls, open space protection polls very low. It's not high on people's minds. Um, while people want things like clean water and, and, and recreation, people don't want to put in the money for, for open space protection. And I think you know what we've seen a lot of is, is kind of the fusing of these things. Uh, you now have to show how many jobs you're creating by doing X, Y, or Z. So I think it's, it's, it comes down to being creative with funding, um, the funding that is out there, ensuring that you're, you're, you're getting economic revitalization at the same time you're getting open space protection, getting transportation. But you know, 
I think we, we're going to have to find new, new measures as well. Um, and I think the plan is going to uh, go into that and, and kind of look at innovative financing mechanisms and, and maybe Rich has, has some more to add to that. Yeah, I do. It, it, it's, it's, all, it's rather terrible. I mean, it's, there's, it's really no good news. And you brought up the real big one, right? Long-term liabilities, unfunded pensions, health care, what have you. Every state has its problems. All the public agencies have it in a really big way. Um, we have a huge backlog in all of our infrastructure systems. Billions and billions of dollars, right? Stuff that, so we're not even you know, the infrastructure we have today is not even at a state of the repair. So we have, we're, we're trying to replace the infrastructure that's decaying, but we have a backlog that we haven't even caught up with. And that's, ev that's like everywhere. There really isn't this one system I can think of in a transportation network of the region that's at a state of the repair, really. Um, so we have this backlog, which everybody points fingers on, like the Northeast Corridor, for instance, has a $20 billion backlog, right? And they, and they point to the federal government's responsibility to make up for that backlog, and they'll take care of everything forward. Well, that's great, but the federal government doesn't have like an infinite amount of money. And the federal government has made it very clear that they're getting out of giving large grants. They, they basically, you know, we'll give you cheap we'll give you cheap money. We'll give you the ability to finance things and you figure out the local revenue source. So, you know, you know, there's a there's an argument that's been made that the states and the federal government are going to be kind of occupied to a certain extent with all these long-term liabilities, other expenses that, quite frankly, there's been legal challenges to sort of these public pensions, when I, and they've lost. I mean, like, the, the agencies want to, like, pay you know, a certain percentage of what they, you know, reduce the, the pensions. Like, no, no, it's an obligation, you have to pay it. So the option is, if they, don't, if they don't have the funds, they have to raise fares, for instance, and then cut service. That's, that's not going to work, especially when uh, we have record high ridership. Um, so it, it's kind of bizarre, right? Because in the United States, you would think record high ridership and all this would be investing, should be investing more than ever. But in reality, highway trust fund is, is broke. The, in the state of Jersey, your your you know transportation trust fund is broke. I mean, you know, this is a problem we have. We have debt that we've never had before in some of these agencies as far as debt levels. And you know, the MTA is a fun one because they did a whole refinancing scheme back in the turn of the century where they pushed out debt and basically re removed the staggering function of debt, which was that every certain number of years you have a refreshed revenue stream. Now we just have, you know, debt and no new revenue, no, you know, basically unlocked revenue streams we can actually bond against. So it's a huge problem. Solutions, they're hard, all right? I mean, some ideas have been, what can we pull from the private sector? Can we get some funding? But, you know, there's, there's a cost of that. Most of the private sector wants a return on investment. So it's very hard to actually get a lead from the private sector. Uh, you might, it, it, you know, the UK is a great example of that, where they've had so many experiments with the private sector, they finally found a sweet spot, I think, with some of these concession agreements that they're working out, like overground and what have you. It took a long time, they wasted a lot of money in the process with the, the two privatization and the, and the national rail privatization and what have you. Um, but, uh, so it's not a simple bullet for us. Another, you know, what everybody's really talking about now is the idea of local funding revenue sources. So how do you do that? That's that's you know value capture. You know where you where you, where you when we're seeing like you know obviously you mentioned New York City and the value of, of, of the cost of housing, right? And you know you have a community that you know you have a group of folks making a tremendous amount of money off building uh, you know luxury housing. Whatnot. How do you capture some of that value to improve and maintain and improve your public transit system because you're adding more density, therefore you need a better you know, transit system to actually accommodate all those people, you need more capacity. So I think I think fees is one way of doing it, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of ideas of how you could actually do value capture with a button and try to pull together other kind of local fees. But that means people are going to pay more essentially fees and taxes to do this. I mean, you know, and, and, and if you look you know, around the world, that's really what's going on too. People pay more locally, um, and or in other cities in the United States, for example, say California, Los Angeles, people pay more locally for better transportation and other infrastructure investments. And then in other, other countries, the national government puts more money into it as well than ours does. Um, and it's considered a greater priority. In our, in our, you know, our, our nation, it's like, you know, a lot of our money goes to, as you know, our, our, our you know, social security and Medicaid, but then you know, a big chunk goes to the defense department. So you know, there's less and less money left over for this. So it's a matter of the feds can figure out a way to come to an agreement to prioritize funding for infrastructure, which is going to be hard. I think people don't have a lot of confidence in that. We'll see what happens with your authorization, which is supposed to happen this spring, but most likely it's going to be you know, 
sorry, it was fall, so it was likely to be punted, most likely, or it's this spring, to be punted. Uh, no one has any confidence that's gonna actually happen during President Obama's term, the Federal Transportation Reauthorization. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, it seems to be local. Everybody's, the, the current consensus is that it's, we're gonna have to figure out how to pay for ourselves here, in our towns and our cities, and our states. Yeah, in terms of the, the housing, I mean, that, that is a tough one. It's neither of our, our expertise at RPA, but, um, you know, you, you can see uh, inclusionary housing policies have helped to some degree, but not to the degree that we're going to need. Um, you know, I would, I would keep an eye on what the de Blasio administration does, because they, you know, that's why they're in office to, to you know, I guess, uh, uh, bring back maybe some of the uh, so it, it bring down some of the inequities that, that happened um, maybe under Bloomberg in, in his kind of thriving uh, luxury city. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what they're able to do. Um, well, I mean, you know, I don't know. We can go out of debate and debate that a little bit. I mean, I, I, I actually think the city, under Mayor Bloomberg, a lot of the things that occurred were down zonings. So the, the mayor actually reduced uh, the densities in New York City uh, by down zoning many of the neighborhoods because there's a lot of like for example the Upper West Side there was an attempt to build skyscrapers on the Upper West Side they built two of them uh, I think it was in the uh, 80s and uh, there was a huge backlash in the community so they they lowered the wild densities in that neighborhood so in order to actually do what you're saying as far as uh, you know, additional housing city it's possible we have to actually rezone areas around transit and there are places around transit that are relatively low density that could be upzoned. The South Bronx is actually full of them because of what happened with the redevelopment of the South Bronx, uh, where if you actually, you know, rezone some of these areas, you actually have greater density, you can actually house more people. That's, that's it's, a, it's, a, it's a community issue, it's a zoning issue, there's got to be a will to do it. There's opportunities even in New York City, we have something called Tribal Rx that we've been talking about for a long time, it's a circumferential uh, rail line through the, uh, basically a very lightly used uh, freight railroad that runs uh, it, can actually, it actually connects from Bay Ridge, all the way runs through Fresh Ponds, Queens, over the Hellgate Bridge, which is used by Amtrak right now only. And it can go all the way to Co-op City, which is part of something called Penn Access. And along that route, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a significant amount of opportunities in, um, in Bronx and in also in, uh, in the Flatlands of Brooklyn to actually build housing. So looking at projects that can actually be transit-oriented, that you can rezone the areas that are potentially, you know, right now, industrial, lightly used. Um, creating a lot of housing opportunities there as well. So we think there is a lot of untapped potential in New York City. The city itself has basically said <coughs> they're, they're capping growth at nine million. So they, they made the decision in their projections that they recently released that they're putting a cap on growth based on current uh, zoning. And like I said, most of the zoning that was done over the last uh, decade was really to, to lower the zone, lower the amount of density, not increase it. So there's, there's an opportunity to Right, but just and just to add to Rich's point that that the idea it's it's not just housing costs that we look at too. It's it's kind of this combined housing and transportation costs. So it just demonstrates the importance of you know you may maybe you're further away, but if your transportation costs are able to kind of be low enough that that get you there, or you or you have adequate public transportation to get you there, that kind of combination of housing and transportation might uh, you know be something that you can aim for uh, a little better in more places. So. Really demonstrates the importance of having a, a good, well-integrated and and uh, public uh, transportation network. Yep. Uh, one thing I, did, I noticed you didn't have in the initial uh, pie of concerns you're looking at is water resources and, and general availability. Is that just general not concern uh, into the future? No. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a very good question. Um, you know, water resources uh, under that little uh, pie chart fall under the kind of parks and landscapes uh, uh, element, but it's it, you know you're not the only one to point that out. So, um, and in this meeting I was at yesterday with environmental groups, they they looked uh, they did polls of people to find out what environmental issues are most important to people, and clean water tops every poll. So. Probably a mistake on our part by not calling water out specifically uh, in that because obviously if you have protected landscapes and you know good you know you'll have clean water but I think you're you're right and you're picking up on what others are that that water should be called out significantly. And to kind of follow up something else, I forget, forgive me if you, if you mentioned it and I just don't remember it. Um, it should sanitation and public health perhaps just I mean from you know a lot of people can throw the trash to riding the subway to you know bioterrorism perhaps. Yeah. I mean, there was a big, you know, some of the Ebola, which didn't 
and then we decided right. we didn't have much basis, but perhaps something else like you know flu, maybe flu. Like yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, uh, we, we actually have some funny looking at public health in the, in the fourth plan, and uh, quite frankly, for me, like one of the things that, that I care a lot about, I mean, it's, it's one problem, many is sort of the, the, the conditions of the riots right in the subway every day, and what that means to your health. I mean, there's, there's an actual, obviously, impact on your hearing because of the noise levels in the stations, and you're ingesting uh, particulates. From the, from the grinding of the wheels. Uh, it's extremely hot in the stations uh, to the point that it's dangerous uh, at certain times of the year. So what do we do about it? And there's, there are a lot of different strategies. None of them are, are cheap, going back to the money thing again. But it seems that we should be looking at it's only to get worse over time. And you know, people are, beyond that, people are just not, you know, I mean, we're, we're tracking so many people that want to live in the city, and then they come here and they realize, wow, this is, this is not really a, really, it's health, you're healthy because you're doing a lot of activity, but you're not healthy because of the environment. And, you know, also, unfortunately, uh, it's related to public health, aging, and all that kind of stuff, you know, there's accessibility of a lot of these facilities that we have as far as, you know, escalators, or really elevators, we only have, right now, there's um, 468 stations, and you can count this down on the roadway, and, you know, we only are required to make them ADA accessible. And so, like, most of the system is not accessible for people that are disabled, Elderly, and for, you know, people forget about mothers with their with their babies and strollers, and uh, people that are going on trips and have luggage. I mean, you know, you want to have a system that's that's you know that works for all those types of folks. Yeah, no, the, the the funding that we got, as as Rich mentioned, to study public health in the plan is is really critical. Um, you know, I think we've we've done a few projects in the past on public health, whether it's you know greenways or how you make healthy communities, but uh, it's going to allow us to kind of link all the planning uh, decisions that we make and, and show um, how those impact public health uh, to make that link even more clear. There's a lot of good groups doing work like that and we're, we're bringing that element into the fourth plan. You know, you guys, we put up with a lot of questions. Thank you so much, that was fascinating. Fantastic.